Tonight's episode is brought to you by 80stees.com. And you can go to 80stees.com right now and find shirts uh, from your favorite cartoons. Favorite movies? Favorite horror movies? Favorite TV shows? And so much more. And on top of that, 30% off your purchase at the site. All you got to do is type in the promo code at checkout, slash tracks 30. Bravo. Bravissimo. 80stees.com. Amazing work. And thank you for sponsoring this episode. Check out the animated intro, and we'll be right back with you. Good evening, and welcome to episode number 15 of Slash Tracks Action News. I'm Alex Vanover. And I'm Josh LaRue. 15. 15 episodes. Wow. Yeah, 15 is not just a Canadian uh, melodrama on Nickelodeon when we were kids anymore. (laughs) 15 is also the number of episodes we have done and are about to finish uh, on this amazing podcast that keeps growing and growing and growing. Whether or not the guy who left the shitty comment... From the previous mean comments in episode 14, likes it or not, or wants it to or not, we're here to stay, bud. So, Josh, um, you told me a discouraging word before we started filming. You said you were holding back on something. What are you holding back on tonight? And you said you were kind of suffering. You're going to have to suffer through this episode. What are you doing tonight? How are you suffering? You talking about the camera? No, what the, the drink. What are you drinking? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Regular, regular Pepsi. I'm Josh treating is... my Cristal Pepsi. Uh, I'm just I'm opening up a 20 ounce and taking a couple drinks, putting it back up, uh, treating it like a two liter. I've got two and a half left. So I'm very proud of you. Uh, Self restraint is a pillar <laughs> of good health, mental and phys- physically, and you're on your way to success, bud. So I'm proud of you for doing that. That's big time. Yeah. It'll protect my wallet, too, you know? The longer I wait to buy more from eBay for, like, $10 a bottle. $10 a bottle, man. I'd have to win the World Series to drink one of those, I think. I'd have to be the guy to hit the home run. Josh, I want to... Yeah, just... You get one once every year. $10 crystal, crystal, okay? Josh, let's, uh... Well, you know what? Give me one second. I don't want to get right into the mean comment, nice comment. We got to talk about our shirts real quick. Josh, oh. what are you wearing? What are you wearing? I'm wearing the Hot Rod Rowdy Roddy Piper shirts uh, from 80stees.com. What are you wearing? I'm wearing the Crimson Guard G.I. Joe shirt. I've worn this in a few uh, episodes prior. It's also in the ad. Uh, it's one. It's my favorite shirt. Makes me look buff. Red's my color. Brings out the color of my baby blues, I think. Nice little, nice little contrast there. And I'm feeling good. I'm looking good. So are you. You fill that shirt out nicely. And uh, proud to be here with you and your co-host. Looking jacked tonight, Josh. And uh, our viewers can look jacked, too. All you got to do is go to 80stees.com and use the promo code. Slash tracks 30, Josh. And you get 30% off. Heck yeah. You know, uh, you saying that one makes you look buff. You know what makes me look buff? My gun's here. What? Right there. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Let's see what I got real quick. Hold on. We'll see what I'm working with. Oh, that's that's without even flexing. Dude. Hey, Josh, you got some butt, you got some pipes, dude. You got a little tattoo there, uh, Josh. Oh, I ain't afraid of no tattoo. All right, Josh. 
We're going into we're going into the compliment sandwich of the episode. Episode number fifteen. We're going nice comment, mean comment, nice comment of the week. And I've got a comment about one of the mean comments we got on the last episode. I okay. think they just I think they just didn't finish their 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 comment. But go ahead. Okay. All right. Nice comment. The most fun I've had on YouTube in a while. Robloxa Al Perim, and that's on episode number fourteen. Uh. I butcher these names constantly. I don't know where these people come up with these YouTube names, but thank you so much for the for the nice comment. That's a great compliment. Thank Big you. Yeah. Roblox is fun. My kids love Roblox. Thank you yeah. for watching. Yeah, thanks, Roblox. Uh, mean comment. Yeah. <laughs> this is on episode number 13 of the podcast. Oh, it's you, not the last one? We got a couple on that one. <laughs> yeah, those I those two comments we got on episode number 14 were kind of whatever. They weren't desi- they weren't deserving of mean comment of the week. They were kind of okay. just like, okay, you're a dick. Uh, I don't care what you say. Uh, they weren't truly, truly mean. I wasn't, like, worried about it after I... Like, when I normally see a really mean comment, I kind of think about it for a second, question myself. Those yeah. were whatever. Fuck them. Uh, mean comment. This is a good one. You two just annoy the shit out of me. Sorry, not sorry. Musiki Fun on episode number 13. He told us exactly what he thought. And at the end of his uh, his comment there, Josh, he had a circle with like a slash through it. Like, like we are just no bueno. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like, we are, we are banned from his life. Well, you need to Musiki your fun elsewhere, you know, and... Uh... If it's that bad, don't take the time because apparently it's good enough that you want to stick around long enough to leave a comment and give us that view. So uh, I guess uh, intelligence and you know charisma just uh, ruins this guy's day. It annoys him. He's annoyed by charisma and intelligence and fun. I don't. I mean, when people leave me in comments like that, the, the first thought I have is, I can't believe this guy has enough time in his day to watch something he doesn't like and then not only watch it, but stay and leave a comment on it. If I don't <laughs> like something, I just click off it and go to something else. We, I'm had, not one be on dick, episode, you know? uh, we had one on episode 14 that just said F. And what I think happened was they were trying to write fun show, mm-hmm. you know, and they weren't paying attention or something. Yeah. And they only got the first letter on there. So I, I replied to their comment, the F, then I put a space, you in, finish the comment next time. <laughs> I, uh, if you, I saw that comment too, um, the F, just the F, and I, if you look at my response, um, mine's edited, so you can see that I edited it, because my very first response that I sent was F you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, I, I was like, I, I'm not... That's taking the low road. I'm going to take the high road. So I kind of, I said something else. I can't remember what I said, but yeah, my first response was F U. I should, if you'd left it, I could have put F U N show. Um, could have been a little, could have been fun there. And I just want to say for anybody watching, if it's, if I'm like looking down, it's because I've got the screens here in front of me with Alex here and my camera's up here. So I can't just constantly look up at the camera. You know, I'm, kind of looking everywhere josh that's i think that's josh i think that's nice that you think people are just zeroed in on you the entire show but uh i i would say nine out of ten people watching this are in bed right now asleep uh listening to us with their phone on the pillow they're not looking at either one of our mugs right now but that's nice that you think they're just looking deep into your eyes right now the entire episode (laughs) oh i wonder what josh and alex have to say oh my god i've got to look right at them Oh. He was killed by the giant horse cock. What's Somebody's that? half asleep. Somebody's half asleep right now, and they're like, "What? What the fuck are they talking about?" Oh, okay. So that's just in case somebody's asleep there. Okay. Um, uh, just hey. woke him up, made him made him pay attention. All right. Uh, enough with scaring people that are asleep listening to the show at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, last mean no, I already did mean comment. Let's you you distracted me, dude. I'm out of the zone. Last <laughs> nice comment of the segment of this show. You guys seriously brighten my day. And this is from Cork Yock Vegas uh, on episode number 14. You brighten our days. That's what I told them. <laughs> Thanks, Cork Yock. You, you definitely, you stole my line too. She definitely, or he, I don't know if Cork Yock is male or female. I don't know if it's they, them, what, but thank you, Cork Yock. You also brighten my teeth. 
Yeah, thank you strength. so much for your comment. Well, Corkyok doesn't just brighten his teeth. They strengthen my gums and enamel. So how about that? Yeah, and repair my dental. That, that and those of Prexera. <laughs> yeah, it's, thanks, Prexera, for helping our dental issues. Um, Josh, let's get into fun facts tonight. Let's do it. All right, first fun fact. Josh, if you were truly one in a million, then there are roughly 7,960 people just like you. Okay. Yeah. You just ruined it, but okay. Yeah, so if you're telling some gal, you know, that you met at the local bar, you know, you're one in a million, babe. Like, I'd really like to bring you back to the slasher to the slasher estate and lay it down. Uh, and you say one in a million, it's a pretty good comment, but you'd probably get, probably make a little more headway if you said one in a billion. Oh, okay. There we go. Then there's only like seven or eight. Yeah, yeah. So there's only yeah. So you know, pick up your game. I don't, game. Think, I don't think my wife would appreciate me doing that either. You know, might be a little well, crowded back at the slasher estate. The slasher estate. Hey, Beth, <laughs> just brought this brought this chick back home from the bar. I'm gonna try to sleep with her. Uh, unfortunately, I said she's one in a million as opposed to one in a billion. So I'll let you know how things go. Jails in Brazil, Josh, uh, reduce the sentences of their prisoners by four days and up to forty eight days a year. For every book that the prisoner reads and that they uh, uh, end up writing a book report on. Wait, the prisoners have to write book reports? No, they, they don't have to, but they can. So if they read a book and they write a book report on it, they can have time taken off their sentence. And they can have up to 48 days uh, a year taken off their sentence just by doing book reports. <laughs> it's like, quit stabbing each other and read a book. <laughs> Um, will, will you stop trying to rape your cellmate and read this Catcher, Catcher in the Rye novel, please? <laughs> I'm trying to catch something. Uh, um, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That, I think that should be implemented everywhere. Um, take a look. Yeah. It's in a book. Reading in Brazil jails. Uh, hey, Josh, NASA has no official protocol for what to do with an astronaut's body if one were to die in space. No protocol at, other, at, at all. So if me and you are astronauts, we're in space, we die. NASA has no idea what to do with our bodies, and they haven't planned for it. But they do have a plan for masturb masturbation protocol, as we talked about in the previous episode. So if you want to you know, rub one out on the spaceship, can't do it because you might impregnate a female astronaut that you're riding up there with. But if you die, Josh, they have no idea what to do with your body. No protocol whatsoever. Just let it let it have a burial at space. You know, let them, you let them float out there with the Black Knight satellite. Dude, there's a pretty good chance that, like, I know they do uh, very strict health tests and physical uh, fitness regimes and stuff, and you have to, like, pass a lot of tests to even go into space. But, you know, you're going through the Earth's atmosphere at a very high rate of speed. Um, <laughs> you probably could have a heart attack or a stroke. You could die up there. It's amazing to me that they don't know what to do with a dead body once they get into space. That's crazy. You think they would have thought of that before they sent, like, 93-year-old William Shatner up there and everything, you know, or let him go up there? NASA didn't send him, I know, but... Who was it, Elon Musk or somebody that sent him? I don't even know who sent him up there, but I, I just, like, when I heard that he was going to space, it was like, they're like, wow, you know, he played uh, Captain Kirk in the 60s uh, in Star Trek. Wouldn't it be so neat if we sent him into space? And it's like, I guess, like, you know, you're going to have his death on your hand. It was, like, basically the same thought I had when I heard Ric Flair was wrestling again. It's like, I this might not, so yeah, this might not end well for William. I How was thinking he the same thing. Uh, a second ago, you beat me to the Ric Flair thing for sure. Did, did Shatner? Did Shatner have his toupee on when they went into space? <laughs> was that under the helmet? How does that work? Was he? Because he's been bald. He that's not his hair. I'm yeah, not. I'm not breaking news here. Like that's not his hair. <laughs> and Burt Reynolds also had toupees, by the way. Burt Reynolds had so many toupees and expensive toupees that when he got divorced from Lonnie Anderson, um, there was actually the cost of his toupees were figured into the divorce settlements because it was considered like an asset that he had. Like he had like hundreds wow. of thousands of dollars of like specially made toupees. Yeah, for real. I don't want to say a name because I don't know if you'd want me to say his name, but a friend, acquaintance really, a friend of a friend 
uh, went and had this um, special toupee made. It cost him like a thousand dollars, a little more. He had to get insurance on it. Uh, it was like real hair. It's not. It's not exactly an implant. There's glue used. It's like a permanent toupee. Yeah. And within three weeks, he had to remove it because he had. He was growing mold. Um, on the top of his head because of the moisture, right? That was yes. trapping in between it. Yes. And they refused to refund him or replace it or anything. I don't know the name of the company, but uh, I was like, you should sue those people, man. Um, I, I thought that was weird. I can't believe that happened. If I spent that much money, you know, I don't have that problem, obviously. But if I did and I spent that much money, I'd be pretty pissed that I was growing, you know, my own mold samples. Uh, I mean, you that's, know, just, that's just for your friends. Your friends should know better. Like he's. <laughs> He's bald. He's putting stuff on his hair. He's probably sweating and walking around or doing whatever he does with his hair on that he bought. They told it's him gonna... he could. Well, I don't. Of course they did. They want to sell the product for a thousand dollars. They're like, <laughs> so he's up there growing mold on top of his dome. Um, I just kind of oh, feel God. like he should have known that was kind of like possibly could happen. I'm not. I don't even know who you're talking about. I'm just saying it's kind of like. When I okay, when I first moved out of my mom and grandparents' house, um, the first time I learned a valuable life's lesson about sweat and mold and stuff, I, I like ran one day and I threw all my clothes in my hamper and then didn't go back to the hamper for like two weeks. <laughs> well, guess what happened? Oh, God. All the clothes in the hamper were just destroyed with mold. I mean, that's kind of the same. You can't just be sweating on your toupee all day long and not expect some shit to go down. I mean, in, in his defense, this is stuff that he, they told him would be safe to do. Like, it was part of what the selling point of the toupee. So there, yeah. there's blame on both ends there. I can put blame on both ends. Maybe he didn't do proper drying or mm -hmm. something. I don't know. But before we move on too far, I wanted to – we're talking about Shatner. Uh, you've seen Breaking Bad, right? Absolutely. I've seen I'm, – I'm, like, rewatching okay. it for the seventh time. Yes, I'm, I'm saving the last three episodes of Better Call Saul to watch all at once, so I don't know what happened last week or yesterday, or, you know, I'm going to wait till this coming Monday's over. I'm not going to read any spoilers. I'm going to binge, me and Beth are going to binge the last three episodes. Don't but get on during, social media, uh, then, if that's what you want to do. But the point I was trying to make uh, is during Breaking Bad, uh, Badger and Skinny Pete have this talk in an episode. I'm not a big trekker. Like, I like Star Wars. I've seen a little bit of Star Trek. Track. I'm not really in the know about it, but they had this discussion when they were high on meth in an episode uh, about how every time characters were beamed down and beamed back to the ship, they were actually being killed and cloned. So over the span of the series, anybody that was beamed over and over, like it was like their thousandth, thousandth clone, you know, or whatever, 352nd clone. And they were killed the first time they were beamed down. Have you ever heard this thing? No, I only heard it on Breaking Bad. Uh, so, like, every time they say beam me, every, anytime they beam themselves, they're already dead, and it's just a clone version of themselves, like a broken down version over and over and over again that keeps yeah. disintegrating. Yeah, they disintegrate it and then put it back together, you know, as a clone when they get, when they get, that's how they get transported. Uh, that's, that's very macabre and, you know, and sad to look at uh, Star Trek that way. Uh, but apparently, a big a big portion of the fan base uh, that's what they that, that's what they believe. So, I think that Shatner doesn't have to worry about you know becoming a clone of his uh, car of his carcass, his dead body back in the '60s when he got beamed up over and over and over again. I think Shatner should have been worried about what kind of STDs he could have got from sleeping with different female aliens on every planet that he tried to <laughs> discover. He's got some. That would be a fun episode. Yeah, he, yeah. Captain Kirk goes to the clinic to find out what kind of <laughs> alien STDs he got on the previous episode's adventures. Wasn't like, there a doctor in the cast? You know, yeah, that's that Scott, Scotty, Scotty, right? Scotty. Wasn't Scotty yeah, the doctor? Yeah, it, we need to I find. Do it. I can't do it, Kirk. I don't got the. Penicillin. Yeah, you just took the word right out of my mouth, you <laughs> son of a bitch. We don't have enough penicillin up here. We got to go to Earth, and we don't, we don't even know where we're at anymore. <laughs> um, 
Hey, Josh, did you know that a woman is more responsive to uh, romance when her stomach is full? Oh, it's the other way around with guys, really. What do you mean? Like when we're hungry, we're more responsive to romance? because yeah, it's like cooking us something, you know? Oh, well, I mean, not when you're full, though. When, or when you're hungry, hungry. When I'm hungry, I'm hangry, dude. I'm, I want to eat. <laughs> I don't want to... I don't want romance. That's the last thing on my mind. I want a sandwich. I want lasagna. I want enchiladas. No. Uh, But I was just saying, man, if we ever, with our respective partners, man, if we ever try to get laid, man, maybe just go down to the delicatessen and bring them back a hoagie. Things might might (laughs) grease the wheels of industry in our favor. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So an all-you-can-eat buffet is, like, guaranteed love, right? No, because you'll fall asleep after you're done going through. For, well, we already discussed on the previous episode about buffets. You're getting one plate anyway. You're just getting charged more. Yeah, you're not. Point. You're not. I'm going to say it again. Buffets are great in theory. Like, but I. Okay. Say you're going to a buffet and you pay the thirty nine ninety nine or whatever. It's got all this amazing stuff. You go through the line the first time. You're full of shit. Okay. You might go get a little <laughs> a little bit of dessert or something. So you wasted money. And you're not going back again. Or maybe you go twice through the line, but you still only get, like, two smaller plates, which w- would equal the one big plate. Either way, it's the same thing. I don't know. If you're, if you're a normal person, it's not really working out in your favor, math-wise. My stomach's growling while we're doing the episode, too. Like, I'm like... Are you hungry right now? <laughs> I'm pretty hungry. I've, I've only had breakfast today. Yeah. So. Drink that Pepsi and uh, get your game face <laughs> on. Let's go right into the next fun fact. In 1719, prisoners in Paris were offered freedom as long as they were willing to marry a prostitute and move to Louisiana. <laughs> that's that's where the LaRue's came from. Right there. <laughs> They're all from Paris. They were all bright. They all moved. We really did come from France, ended up in Louisiana, and spread across the country. But I don't know if it's that... My ancestors tried to assault, uh, assassinate royalty and were kicked out of France. Um, That's what you want to think. for another day. Huh? That's what you want to think. It, it turns out that your ancestors were the ones who were like, here's a hooker, here's some land. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> See you later. The story that, that, that we've been, that's passed down through our family is the one of the assassination attempt. But I can see it. That was just their cover. You know, they didn't want to say, we married some hookers in New Louisiana. <laughs> and it was a really sweet deal, Josh. Like, the financial package they offered back then was just sex and free land, so we took the bait. Josh, <laughs> last fun fact of the episode. Females, okay, what you got? Female stingrays can store a male's sperm for years and use it to become pregnant whenever they want. And if you hey, and if you're scoring at home and you have your slash tracks news bingo card, yes, we just had a fun fact involving sperm. All that foam on the beach is well sperm, by the way. Um, you oh, know, there's probably. Oh my god. Huh? Oh my god, that's disgusting. <laughs> you know that? <laughs> so whales are just blowing loads in the ocean over and over and over again to produce that much. Yes, all that foam on the beach is is well sperm. Okay. <laughs> all the videos of people running through it and dogs running through it. God, opening no, their mouth while they're swimming and stuff, getting it in their nose and eyes and stuff. This the stingray thing though. Just imagine uh, if like women that dated people that went on to become like famous athletes and singers and stuff. You know? Yeah. Got, oh, they're famous. Ooh, now I got some money. Gotcha, bitch. <laughs> Activate. Yeah. Anybody who dated Oprah, like, on the Chappelle show years before, like, boom, gotcha, bitch. Uh, <laughs> that's, like, the ultimate savings account. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you don't need to, bank. Yeah. You don't need to save money anymore. Just save somebody's load for a rainy day. <laughs> and if they become famous or successful, boom, you're pregnant. There you go. <laughs> hey, Josh, let's uh, move off the whale sperm talk and uh, the stingray sperm talk, and let's move into Slash Strax uh, Sports. Let's do it. All right. 29 years ago, last week, Robin Ventura of the Chicago White Sox, he was about 23, 24 years old, charged the mound after getting beamed by a 46-year-old Nolan Ryan. 
So he gets beamed by Nolan Ryan in a baseball game. He takes umbrage with it. He decides to charge the mound. Nolan Ryan's 46 years old, got a 23-year-old stallion running towards him. Nolan Ryan doesn't run from the situation. He takes his mid off, motions for Robin Ventura to keep coming, throws Robin Ventura in a headlock, and proceeds to beat the living piss out of him. So Nolan Ryan beans him. Robin Ventura charges the mound, and then Nolan Ryan puts him in a headlock and beats the living shit out of him. And that photo of Nolan Ryan with Robin Ventura in a headlock, like doing this, you can find that in a sports bar anywhere near you all over the United States because it's one of the greatest moments ever. Nolan Ryan, he he was the pitcher for the Rangers, right? Texas Rangers? Yeah, yeah. You don't um, fuck with people from Texas, man. <laughs> mm-mm, mm-mm. No, that guy was... Um, in the off season, he owned a cattle ranch, and part of his like workout regimen was just like milking cows and chasing bulls and driving a tractor and milking yeah whatever he um but Nolan Ryan had one of the most uh like lengthy careers of a baseball player. His longevity was like unheard of. He pitched in the sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties, and he threw seven no hitters. So nobody has even came close to that. So seven games uh, he pitched in his career, he no-hit another team. He also has the record for one-hitters, and he has the record for two-hitters. So Nolan Ryan, most strikeouts ever, and most ass-whoopings on rookie players <laughs> in a game, too, apparently. just a And, of course, he's from Texas. That's the thing. The team was yeah. the Texas team. Yeah, Nolan Of course, Ryan, the yeah. ass-kicking that happened was in Texas. That, that's... I knew Nolan Ryan. I had a lot of Nolan Ryan cards when I was a kid. I I tried collecting baseball cards and basketball cards for a while, even though I didn't watch it. Yeah. It was just fun. Um, Nolan Ryan. Killer cards. Did you ever have those? Yeah, I had a... I I collected... uh, I didn't just collect baseball cards. I collected Garbage Pail Kids cards. I collected Star Wars cards, ALF cards, Ninja Turtle cards, any kind of, like, Batman. Um, I still have all my old... Uh, golden age WWF cards like from the early 80s uh, that with the blue border pretty cool I want to uh, make a, a slash tracks note for the wrestling topic tonight I want to bring up if you remind me about wrestling buddies that's something I wanted to remember okay uh, but because you, you're talking about the WWF cards reminded me of that but yeah I, I, I tried collecting cards like sports cards I've tried uh, I tried playing baseball as a kid, and I got within my first like three practices and first game, I got hit by the ball like seven times oh, as a damn. magnet. So I was just I, I got tired of getting hit. Um, but yeah, I had all those cards. I had like Batman, Batman Returns, uh, Ghostbusters. Uh, that was a lot of fun. The '80s and '90s were a great time to be a kid. They really were. It's also a time when they just mass produced anything collectible. <laughs> If it said it was collectible in the 90s on the box, chances are it's actually not collectible. Uh, It's not. You know what I mean? It's like, or it's like a collector's item. If it says collector's item, mm mm-mm. It's the shit that... How many people bought... (laughs) Go ahead. How many people bought the death of Superman? Like, like millions and millions? Yeah, breaking of the bat, where Bane breaks Batman's back. Any comic... Any comic that said number one... Uh, in the 90s probably wasn't the actual number one it was probably just number one for that comic line of that time frame so like i remember when i was a kid uh they had like the uncanny x-men and then they had like the new x-men but i remember in the 90s they kind of rebooted the x-men and everybody was like oh my god x-men one two three four five and everyone was trying to get these new x-men number one two and three those aren't worth anything nothing like you, they're probably they'd be worth more if I wrote the show rundown on the pages. <laughs> You'd make more money from uh, clicks on this episode than you would from actually selling the comic. Exactly. Hey, Josh. <laughs> Josh, did you? Uh, are you familiar with Barry Bonds at all? Have you heard that name, baseball player? I heard the name. Yeah. Okay, he's the Most all-time home runs or something. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Josh, you nailed it, man. Uh, in 2004, which was one of Barry Bonds best statistical seasons, uh he had 373 actual at bats and he re- reached base safely in 376 of those at bats. So he reached base three more times 
than he had actual at bats. Um, how did that happen, you ask? Because he was a walk machine. Um, whenever you get walked, uh, it's not considered an actual at bat, but it would it would be considered be reaching base if you get walked. So his on base percentage was better than a thousand. Uh, do pitchers really do that? Like as a tactic, if they see yes. somebody they know is going to hit it out of the park, they yes. walk them instead. Yes. yes. Is that illegal? No. Um, There's no fouls do. or anything. D- Josh, there is a video. There is a video of Barry Bonds that I just saw last week. Um, the bases are loaded. Okay, there's a runner on first, second, and third for the Giants. Barry Bonds is hitting for the Giants. He's coming up. So they intentionally walked him and let a run come in as opposed to letting him hit and hitting a homer and scoring four runs. They actually gave yeah, up a sure. run. I've never I've never seen that before. I Because if, if the bases are loaded, they're like, okay, we're still going to try to get you out. Um, they were just like, no, we're just <laughs> we're just going to give up the run. We're taking the bat completely out of his hands. That, that is should amazing. be a foul or something. I, sh- as a, as a, I, I don't know anything about sports. I just think as an outsider, that, that sounds like be an illegal tactic. Well, it's just like it's chicken shit, um, and it seems like the opposite of the way the game should be played, but it's part of the game, and it's, it makes for interesting topics uh, to talk about, like we're talking about right now, but no, um, it's ridiculous. I actually... When I was in ninth grade uh, in baseball, I got intentionally walked in a Babe Ruth summer league baseball game. I was pretty decent, uh, but I don't I don't remember anyone being on base. I don't remember my team was kind of shitty. Like it was me and like two other guys and a bunch of like nobodies. Like seriously, summer baseball wasn't like high school baseball. Anybody that wanted to play during the summer could play. So you'd have like three or four guys that were decent and then a bunch of nobodies. So I they would just walk me a lot. I got intentionally walked, man. Because they're like, let the kid, let the newspaper boy try to hit this guy, you know, whatever. Let them, <laughs> I don't even know. My brother was there, the spoiler was there, and he started yelling. He started yelling at the manager of the Coos County Deputies baseball team who walked me because my brother had played for that coach like five years prior. He's like, you're a chicken shit. You're walking my brother. Let him hit or whatever. But it, I don't know. As, an, as, a, ninth, as a ninth grader, I kind of thought it was cool. I was like, man, this is like major respect. This is awesome. Yeah. I hope there's some girls from school that see this because there's no yeah. social media back then. Social media back in ninth grade, Josh, somebody's got to see it and then just immediately sprint to their friend's house and tell them <laughs> and then they sprint to their friend's house, right? And that's how the text messaging worked back in the mid to late 90s. Like, tweet, 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 tweet. Yeah, you would, like, that was phys- what? <laughs> yeah, you would physically... <laughs> Tweet like a bird to your friends. <laughs> no. Do you remember that being a kid and like you're looking for your friends? You'd call their house and then their mom or dad would be like, oh, they're over at Alex's house. So you would get on your bike. You'd ride to my house. I'm not there. My mom or grandpa or somebody would say, no, Josh, he's over there. If you go to the next house and the bikes aren't outside on the lawn, you're pretty much fucked. Like you're not doing anything the rest of the day. You're going back to the eighth grade, eight or 80 slasher Din, you know, and you're going to read some books or whatever, by the way. So, yeah. Can I pull the uh, uh, Slash Tracks grandpa segment real quick, since we're so old? I'd what love I'm about to say. Yeah, do it. Do you remember back, do you remember back in the good old days? Uh, no, back when, I'm sad to see my daughter, like, talking to her boyfriend through text messaging and stuff. Because I remember being in junior high and high school. I would talk on the phone with my girlfriend or a prospective girlfriend all night, like mm-hmm. hours, you know, brothers and sisters, mom, Josh is on the phone, you know, and now it's just. It takes out actually learning about their personality uh, with yeah. just texting. Totally. Yeah. I, I wish she could have that, you know, that my kids could have that. Cause I think that's, you make more connections that way than just. I agree with you 100% on that. The one thing your daughter has going for her, though, with the text messaging is when I would talk to a girl on the phone for too long on the cordless phone, the battery would run down, and then I'd just have to hear my grandpa bitching about how the batteries ran down for the next like, <laughs> two days and about how important it is to put the phone back on the cradle so it charges up and how I just, don't respect, a... how I just don't respect that we have a portable phone, you know? Did you ever get this? 
Alex, are you still on the phone? <laughs> no, they never. My mom and grandma w- would not ask me if I was still on the phone. They they would pick up the other phone and try to stealthily listen, and I could hear their labored breathing on the other end. Which girl my, is this? Which girl no, my, is this? Yeah, <laughs> co- totally co- cock blocking me. No, my I could hear my mom breathing because she was overweight, so she's just having a hard time because she's overweight. And then my grandma was like seventy, and she had post polio syndrome, and she had like nine strokes. So if they tried to be stealthy, I knew immediately they were on the other phone. So come on. The, my biggest issue was definitely hanging the damn portable phone back up. And, you know, the battery, big, big deal in the house where I grew up. Make sure that fucking mobile phone is charged, Josh. Dude, I threw my first cell phone. Me and my sister threw our first cell phone given to us by our parents back in, like, 98 or something out our window into the Arkansas River because we were, we got tired of my mom and dad checking on us too much. You told you me know? this story, and I loved it then, and I love it now. Yeah, the first cell phone that me and my sister were given uh, is like 98 or 99. We threw it out the window because we got sick and tired <laughs> of my parents checking on us. You know, nowadays kids can't live without their cell phone. We can't live without our cell phones pretty much anymore. But back then, we were just wanting to get rid of it, you know. Um but I grew up in a house with four sisters and two brothers. Uh, my two brothers moved out. They, they were a lot older. They were half-brothers. Uh, then my half-sister, one of the four, uh, was only there like every other week and on Wednesdays. But I had three sisters there all the time. And we're talking about like talking to our girlfriends on the phone so the battery runs out and everything. I had this one girlfriend, my first real girlfriend. I was in sixth grade. I was like in love with her. And shout out to Mackenzie. Um... And she broke up with me for an older boy, probably Bitch. a seventh grader. Yeah. And I was crying on the phone. <laughs> my sisters got on the phone and, like, took up for me, like, yelling at her. And uh, you'll never find anybody better. And you're making the biggest mistake of your life. And <laughs> yeah. At the time, it made me feel good. But looking back, it's like, hey, you sixth grader whore. <laughs> you made the biggest mistake of your life. Like, she's never recovered. She's just sitting in a dark corner somewhere yeah. at a sanitarium or something. Oh, I wish I'd made a better decision. You know? Yeah, she never she never bounced back. That was your <laughs> sister scarred her for life. Um, when I was in fifth grade, I got the chicken pox. And before I had gotten the chicken pox, I was dating a girl named Nora. And when I say dating, I mean we played tag together with a, another small group of friends. Um, and we'd hold hands every once in a while. And if square dancing was happening, she was my partner. So, yeah, it was very serious. So I get chicken pox. I'm out for a week. I come back on Monday, a week later, and I'm excited to see Nora. And first recess rolls around, and now she's playing tag with a guy named Brandon. And, yeah, she she traded it. She traded me in, had a brand-new boyfriend. Uh, So I came back from the chicken pox to being dumped. And not having a square dance partner and not being able to play tag with my old friends, uh, my old friend group. That was a hell of a breakup, man. I lost a lot in that. I didn't even get to talk to a lawyer or anything. I just lost the whole kit and caboodle, man. I should have had a prenup. I didn't Fucking get Brandon. Yeah, Brandon, Brandon, a piece of Fuck shit. Fuck you, Brandon. At, he was athletic. He was funny. He was a good looking kid. Brandon. God damn it, Brandon. <laughs> I wish we could like go back in time and like help our past selves out a little bit because one of the reasons she dumped me is because I was in sixth grade and she heard me listening to a song on the phone one night Mm -hmm. and see if I'd been texting her it wouldn't have happened she would have never known um, I was listening to a song and it was from the Power Rangers movie from 1995 oh yeah uh oh we're in trouble or something and that was one of the reasons she broke up with me because I was listening to a Power Rangers movie song okay if I could go back in time I'd be like, hey, Josh, why don't you ask her this since there's no internet or anything for her to look that up? Ask her how the hell she knew that was in Power Rangers. The movie was still in theaters at the time. There was no internet like there is now. So how the hell did she know unless she had seen the movie herself? Yeah, and that is that is tonight's Slash Tracks News gotcha bitch moment of the night. Gotcha bitch. Got her. Hey, Josh, <laughs> let's get into the last sports story of the show. Okay. All right, this is this is quick. Not even really a story. Josh Rosen, he's a quarterback in the NFL. This is his Instagram profile. Okay. Okay. He has a picture. His picture on his Instagram profile is when he was drafted by the Cardinals. His Instagram banner 
is him when he was playing on the Dolphins. His, <laughs> in, his Instagram bio says quarterback for the Falcons. And Josh Rosen, the player we're talking about, is currently a quarterback for the Browns. All that tells me is he's not being kept by any team, apparently. <laughs> and he's also whoever, whoever's in charge of his social media is not doing a very good job at keeping up with the Kardashians here because he's got four different team things on one Instagram profile. Or maybe he just doesn't give a shit, or maybe he's trying to be funny. I don't know, but this is this is fact. You guys can go look at it if you want to. Four different team uh teams represented on one Instagram profile for one quarterback. I thought that was kind of funny. Wow. That's yeah. Fun. Josh, ring the bell, bud. Ring, count ding, to ding, three. Ding. Count to three. We're going into Slash Tracks Wrestling. Let's do it. All right. And I've got a story, too. But let's All go. right. WWE disclosed on Tuesday that since the July 25th announcement, it determined that Vince McMahon made two more additional payments to go uh, that add up to five million dollars, uh, that should also have been recorded in the company's consolidated financial statements, bringing the grand hush money total from Vincent Kennedy McMahon to nineteen point six million dollars. So it's no longer just fourteen million dollars he's paid out to women to shut up after he, you know, had an illicit affair with them. It is now nineteen point six million dollars for Vinnie Mac. I hope it was worth it. It cost you $20 million in your career. 19 and your point. legacy, probably. Yeah, that's the worst part. Um, it's going to be overshadowed. Uh, he did a lot of things for wrestling. He did. Um, he Killing brought... It. He he created the product that a lot of people know and love to this day. WrestleMania is a very big deal. Um, there's a lot of stars he helped create. But there's a lot of people that he's left uh, in his wake... And there's a lot of things other than just paying out hush money to female talent and uh, people that worked in the office that he had had an affair with. He's done a lot of really weird, shady, questionable decisions. Uh, I'll just name a couple real quick. Uh, continuing the show, when Owen Hart uh, tragically fell to his death uh, in Missouri. Uh, that was a really bad decision. I wouldn't have wanted to be in his shoes, but I probably would have stopped the show because I'm not motivated by money. Yeah. Um, I care more about people. Um, he's done a lot of really interesting things with uh, talent. He's he's. I know that he gets a like a lot of people say Vince McMahon's upfront with people, blah blah blah. But I've heard a lot of stories about him not being upfront with people. Um, he likes to play people off of each other. Um, he's been quoted as saying, uh, like. With Brett and Hulk, for instance, he likes, and Brett and Sean, he likes there to be friction so there's a better product on camera. And I think that he caused a lot of that friction. I do too. Um, yeah, so he's done a lot of really shitty things, um, he's but he's done a lot of good things too. What, what he's are you definitely gonna... a sociopath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what a, you know, Josh, I don't know how he, Vince, couldn't be a sociopath by just based on some of the things he's done. Yeah. Um, you know, suing Martha Hart at, like after Owen's death, even though it was a legal maneuver, so he didn't get taken to the ringer, probably not the greatest idea. I mean, that is a shitty, shitty thing to do. Um, I don't know, man. What do you think? I definitely think the man has no conscience. He acts like he does. He's learned to make it appear like he has one. Uh, I think he cares about the business, if he cares about anything, and he mm -hmm. cares about money, and uh, he he's real good at using people, so that's another sociopathic tendency right there. Yeah. He's looking back now, when I try to watch old WrestleManias and stuff, uh, him being buddies with you-know-who, it's hard to watch a couple WrestleManias, because like, anytime that guy's involved with something, they have to like center the attention on him. I was trying to watch one of those WrestleManias, and it's like every five seconds, you know, cutting to him. Um, he doesn't, and, and for that point, he doesn't surround himself with good people usually. Do you? I think he killed, he killed wrestling, indie wrestling, and he bought his. Sorry, he bought his uh, competition, which I think killed. What he he killed indie wrestling. He made wrestling big. 
you know, the big time, took it up, took it from the bars and shit, which took a lot of people's income and livelihood away because there was a lot of workers that didn't get hired by him or WCW. Um, but then he killed that too by running WCW out of business, doing what he did because uh, he snuck in underneath Eric Bischoff's nose and bought it for the soul, just so he could say he had it. But by doing that, he didn't have to put out a great product anymore because he didn't have competition. And he could just be middling the and worst, then when he went public, it made it worse. The worst thing that ever happened was WCW going out of business. It was the worst thing that could have ever happened because they had no competition anymore. They were the only big game in town. As soon as you reach the mountaintop, uh, you're supposed to be at the bottom of another mountaintop. I, and it's really weird because you see all these things about Vince McMahon being just hungry for success and driven and everything. It seemed like as soon as WCW was gone and he owned them, he reached the mountaintop, and he was just skating on the past Attitude Era crap for, like, 20 years. Like, every day there, there was another uh, the Monday Night Wars DVD compilation. Let's do the same interviews over and over and over again about, about how great we are. It's like, we don't give a shit. Why don't you put a product out that's good? And also, can we please stop having Robbie three hours? And can we also stop having two nights of WrestleMania? And can we also please stop having five-hour pay-per-views? Because guess what, Josh? Back in the good old days, because I know I'm an old wrestling head. I know a lot of people say, oh, old man, shut up. It's like, I'm right. We don't need five hours of pay-per-views. And I'll tell you why. Because back in the day, to be on a pay-per-view like WrestleMania or Royal Rumble or SummerSlam, you had to be good enough and a big enough draw to be on said pay-per-view. They don't need to have an eight-man tag match just to fit your ass in there. Be better. And then the product will be better. And then the show will be better. And then it'll make more money. And more people will talk about it. And then they'll buy the next show. End of discussion. The yeah. end. Because I don't Sorry. want to hear somebody say that they can only work with what they're giving. given. Uh, because I know a guy named Stephen Williams that was handed the ringmaster gimmick. I was just going to say Steve Austin. I, I, you're 100% correct with where you're going with this. Yeah, and the ringmaster could have got... He could have been fired because it sucked. It was horrible. But he became Stone Cold Steve Austin. Vince McMahon didn't make him that. He became that. Mm -hmm. You know? So um, he turned he chicken, chicken, chicken yeah. shit and turned it into chicken salad, man. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Hey, uh, 23 years ago, yesterday, Josh, Y2J, Chris Jericho debuted on the WWE when the count, when the millennium countdown clock went to zero while the rock was in the ring. One of my favorite promos of all time. And also when Chris Jericho comes back, I think it was like 2006 or something. Yeah. When he came out, the codes and stuff on the stream, save us, Y2J. Uh, I love that return. I was I was a big Jericho fan for that return, uh, the second one. Uh, yep. I enjoyed that one. I was still a WCW fan in 99. I stuck with them until the end. So When Jericho debuted on Raw and The Rock was in the ring, that was showing a lot of confidence in Chris Jericho as a performer. Yeah for his very first segment to be put in the ring with at the time, because Stone Cold was hurt, yeah. put, put, put Y2J in the ring with a microphone against the number one wrestler in the company at the time. And I'll never forget when Chris Jericho, he, he comes out and the rock is, and who, and who are you? And he's like, just, and Jericho's about to answer. And the rock's like, it doesn't matter what your name is. Oh, it was great. That was great. Those two guys, do you remember when um, The Rock and Jericho were with Stephanie McMahon and they just went back and forth talking about Stephanie McMahon's boob job? Yeah. Oh, man. That was great TV. I, I loved a lot of The Rock and Hurricane, too. That was some great shit. Called him the, the Hamburglar? Rock, yeah. The <laughs> Rock is the one that told Vince to put the hurricane over him that one night on Raw. That was yeah. all The Rock. <laughs> I like the dude, the rock backstage um, wasn't a political guy, man. He got over based on just his performances and his charisma. Um, he took a lot of shit from Triple H and Shawn Michaels when he first broke in because they saw a star in the making and they did not like him and they were trying to keep him down. Uh, I don't know if a lot of the slashaholics know that, but the rock persevered and ended up becoming a bigger star than both of them. I mean, hands down. 
You need to watch Young Rock. I have uh, been. I've I have been. I, I've actually been watching it on your Hulu account. So thanks a lot. Uh, you're welcome. At the end of season two, actually most of season two, when it does the uh, like the eighteen to twenty year old Rock segments, it's gonna you're gonna see like uh, the backstage WWF and stuff, Undertaker, yeah. Triple H and shit. It's it's a lot of fun. Pat Patterson. Uh, I love the Macho Man on there. He does a pretty good job. And Andre. Let's hear your Macho Man real quick for uh, Michael and them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thinking, thinking, thinking about watching Young Rock. Yeah, dig it. <laughs> I-, I wanted to bring up a little story. It's not it's not a big story. But uh, since Vince doesn't want to bring back Wrestling Buddies, AEW has brought back Wrestling Buddies. There really? are AEW Wrestling Buddies in stores right now. Did you know about that? I didn't know about that. Who are the, did, you, did you see what characters they are? Uh, the one I saw was Sting, obviously. Heck um, yeah. But there was other ones, so, yeah. Man, Sting, uh, I know we were talking about longevity with Nolan Ryan. Can we talk about longevity with Stinger? Um, he He's diving from the second floor into crowds still, and he's in his yeah. 60s. Dude, that's something yeah. I was going to say earlier about the Vince McMahon sociopathic thing. Another uh, thing about being a sociopath is pettiness and arrogance and narcissism. Yeah. What they did okay. to Sting at WrestleMania. Yeah, it's not just that. It's what he's done every – like you said, he kept making money off the wars, you know, wasn't putting anything fresh. and But he also – every chance he had to beat WCW again, he took it, you know, like with Sting and Triple H. that All that was about was WWF – Bearing WCW a little bit more. That was about his ego, Vince McMahon's ego, and his narcissism. Uh, but yeah, Sting, I think he could have been amazing in WWE. Uh, Seth Rollins had no business powerbombing him into the corners multiple times. You don't wrestle a 57-year-old like you do a 27-year-old, for one. Uh, you respect somebody like Sting, and you work his way, not your way. Sting should have been uh, calling the match. I don't know who was calling that match. Was, yeah, was, I, Sting was... There's no way Sting was calling, powerbomb me in the corner, kid. Give me a uh, buckle bomb. Yeah, give me one of the most dangerous maneuvers you can possibly give me. Hey, by the way, I was at uh, the WrestleMania that you're talking about, Triple H versus Sting, mm-hmm. and Sting was over big oh, time. Yeah, yeah. And well, the way that it. match was set up, Sting was the baby face, and Triple H was obviously the heel, Triple H had no right going over Sting in that match. It made no sense. Um, Spence's ego. It made no sense for, on a couple different levels. But number one is Triple H at the time was a very part-time wrestler. So why should he come out of retirement to go over Sting when Sting was on a more kind of day-to-day, like wrestling more often at the yeah. time contract? So it would make more sense to build up Sting because you're going to use him again. In a exactly. match like right down the road, so you want to build them up to be strong. And then number two, um, why would you like you've got Sting? He's one of the some people put him on the Mount Rushmore of wrestling. Why would you have a character this huge and immediately bury him? It doesn't make any so, sense. It was it was like Vince just wanted to do it because he was a WCW guy. Exactly. That's it. It's his narcissism and his ego. That's all it was. That's why they yeah. did it. I mean, it's like okay, so Triple H beats him, and then Seth Rollins is like. Why do you think you should have a shot at my title? Oh, because I came back and got beat by Triple H. I yeah, mean, none of it made sense. No, none of it made sense. Um, they I'm should proud have. of him in AEW. I'm proud of what he's doing over there. Um, one last Sting thing before we get into the last wrestling story of the show. Um, they could have had him wrestle the Undertaker at a huge pay per view. I know that. Mar- I know he didn't. I know Undertaker didn't want that match because he felt they were both past their prime. He's he's even said it. Uh, Mark, you know, Undertaker has said it. But there's ways you could have worked around that match. You could have had a cinematic match. You could have had an actual match, but had uh, maybe it be a brawl. You could have had you could have had a false count anywhere match. You could have had uh, you could have done so many different things. You could have had it been a tag match. Feel it out, kind of see how it works. Um, you could have did a house show run with it. You could have done threat. Yeah, I mean, else out there. you could have done anything. I feel like if you would have had Sting versus Undertaker, that could have main evented any pay per view at any time. And I feel like it probably is going to sound ridiculous if you had them main eventing a pay per view in 2022 at the ages they're both at, it would still sell out. Yep, 
I, I know the two reasons he had Sting there. A, to bury Sting and bury WCW, and B, so Sting could be in at least a couple WWE events, so he could, you know, sell him in video games, sell his merchandise, and all that shit. That is why he did it, for money and for his ego. That's why Vince did what he did with Sting. But I, like I said, I'm proud of what Sting's doing in, in AEW, almost in WCW. I'm proud of what he's doing in AEW. I'm happy that AEW is doing so good, and I hope they just get bigger. I hope it becomes another WCW uh, one day, because WWE is just... I would love to see people flock back to wrestling like they did in the 80s, but I feel like that's not going to happen. I just don't think you have the same talent uh, like we had back then that people can... It's all just Jeff Johnson, Frank Smith, you know, there's no characters. I don't mean garbage men and repo men, but like there's no character. There's no story. Uh, I think Bray Wyatt was an amazing character. His character was fucking amazing. Uh, and it was more than just a name. It was a character. He had he had a story. He had everything. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm glad Sting's given it you know one more go. And I think they're handling him correctly. I love seeing like Jake the Snake as a manager over there. Uh, AEW is treating the legends with respect. Vince doesn't really do that. I'm, yeah, that is good. I'm glad to see that too. You know what else I'm glad to see, Josh? Uh, I'm glad to see that Virgil, <laughs> million dollar man, uh, ex bodyguard and manager, Virgil Vincent in uh, NWO when he went to WCW. Virgil claims that he's had sex with over one million women, Josh, in a recent interview. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know he's got him and Lord Alfred Hayes have the biggest Johnsons in uh, wrestling history, right? I didn't know that. I wasn't there to measure them. Uh, uh, According to rumors and locker room talk, Vincent uh, uh, Virgil and uh, Lord Alfred Hayes had like monster dongs, apparently. Um, so maybe that's why he slept with so many women. Uh, well. The person who was interviewing Virgil actually called him out on this with an actual math equation. Virgil, yeah, there's no way. Virgil was born April seventh, nineteen fifty one, and in order for him to have one million women in his lifetime, he would have to average one woman every thirty seven point five minutes of his lifetime. The math, the math. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. I, I've slept with a million women, uh, as in. Uh, how much the million dollar belt cost, you know, or how much money Ted DiBiase really had as a million dollar man. <laughs> Dude, Virgil, I don't know if you guys know this, the Slashaholics know this about Virgil, but this guy is a joke. He, like, sets up, like, you know how you'll go to cons and people will have pictures of themselves wrestling behind them and they'll have a six by eight, you know, a six footer or an eight footer table with a skirt around it and, like, a tablecloth? Yeah. He, he sets up his table and his pictures, like, in subways. Not conventions. He just subways, bus depots, restaurant doors. There's pictures all over the place. There's pictures of Vir it's called lonelyvirgil.com. There's pictures of him uh, at conventions with nobody in his line at all. Uh, Virgil's not sleeping with a million women. Okay, first of all, and number two, he's got to be one of the weirdest guys that's uh, ever been in professional wrestling. He's got this weird gimmick now where he talks about his meat sauce and he talks about. Italian restaurants. He's got this thing about Olive Garden. He says he has the best meat sauce in the game, and like, I, I don't know, man. You need, you guys need to look up Slashaholics. Look up Lonely Virgil. Um, he's a really interesting guy. He's a weirdo. He's a joke. He's been a joke since the beginning, anyways, because the whole reason he was called Virgil was a jab at Dusty Rhodes, and the whole reason he was called Vincent was a jab at Vince McMahon. Yeah, like his he, gimmicks have been jabs at other promoters. You yep. know, yep. And he wore wore peppermint uh, tights <laughs> to wrestle. Uh, I always hated that shit. <laughs> uh, so hey, yeah. So Virgil, go away. You didn't sleep with a million girls. All right, Josh. Let's leave the let's leave the wrestling in the past. Let's leave Virgil and his meat sauce and uh, Lord Alfred Hayes' big dong in the past. And let's go straight into horror and spooky news. Horror and spooky news. Let's All right. Do it. On July 28th, 1989, so last week, 33 years ago, Kane Hodder 
dressed as Jason Voorhees, appeared on the Arsenio Hall show promoting his new movie, Jason Takes Manhattan, in full character, and Arsenio Hall interviewed him as Jason the entire time. He asked him question after question after question, and J- Kane Hodder didn't answer because Jason doesn't talk. He yeah. did the whole interview not speaking. Arsenio and him were amazing in this interview. Oh, it's great. If anybody hasn't seen it, they should watch it. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of dead, dead air. No, uh, wait, pun intended. Uh, dead air, but it's it's funny. It's fun. Uh, I like it's, it when our I like it when Arsenio's like. So what do you do when you're not killing people? He's like asking him questions, like normal questions. He's like, so, and then uh, Kane Hodder like does the Jason head tilt. He he maintains very steady eye contact with Arsenio. You know, Arsenio had to be a little bit creeped out. Oh, I'm sure. You know what I mean? He probably, he, he's probably told Kane would talk or something, you know? Or uh, anything. He's holding an axe on, on set in the interview. He's like holding that fireman's axe. I when, think when they were filming it, when they were filming the movie, he went through Times Square and stuff and took pictures with people and uh, scared people and shit there in New York City. The one, the like two scenes they actually filmed in New York, uh, he had a lot of fun with it. I wish they had uh, some behind the scenes clips of that. The only behind the scenes clip that I've seen is the one that you showed me where he's got a dildo attached to his waist when the girl, the, the girl opens up the boat. Like, She's door. Like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. And Kane Hodder's got a big old freaking Lord Alfred Hayes strap size on. strap on. Yeah. A Virgil Vincent strap on on. Um, <laughs> that would be terrifying. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's I, worse. No. The X or the... I was going to say, um, I think... I think, Ar- I think Arsenio had a major missed opportunity by not having uh, Robert England as Freddy Krueger in character on, on one of his shows. I think that Robert... Would have did a really, really good job in that situation. Man, that just brings up a uh, pain I feel from Friday versus Jason. I wanted to see Kane and Robert together for so long, and then mm-hmm. Ken Kurzinger uh, did like the they did the prize fight uh, press conference. Yeah, between Freddie and Jason, the weigh in in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kane, I wish he could. I wish he could have done all that. He worked so hard. To help get Freddy versus Jason made, and then he was just cast aside. Um, but at least he's got that one over Freddy. He appeared on a, a late night talk show like that. I'm sure Robert did at some point, but uh, uh, Arsenio they, uh, was great for that. They even New Line Cinema went even as far so far as to send Kane Hodder the script of Freddy versus Jason. Yeah. Um, he was removed late, late into the game of the filmmaking process, like right before they were about to shoot or just about to start dailies or whatever. Um, Based on but, the lie. Based yeah, on the lie. Ken, Ken Kersinger had claimed that he played Jason on screen, uh, which he did. But it was Jason Takes Manhattan. He's like in two scenes, like he's walking down the stairs uh, of the ship in one scene, and in the other scene, he's the guy, the stunt Jason, who jumps on the front of the cab, or the car. That's it. Yeah, but, yeah, he he has more screen time as the cook in the cafe when Kane Hodder throws him through the mirror behind the restaurant wet bar. Like, the counter, the countertop. So, yeah, Ken Kersinger, uh, not a big fan of you. Uh, I don't like it. Nice guy. I don't care. Yeah, Yeah, but but I... I Hey, I've heard he is a nice guy, but I'm not going to be asking him to be on uh, getting sidetracked anytime soon. Exactly. I don't want to hear his mouth uh, spew lies to the Slashaholics. I want to try to get CJ back for uh, getting sidetracked. Um, that would be a lot of fun. That would be a lot. You know, Josh, since we're talking about getting sidetracked, um, Andre from Monster Squad, I the, he's the main character in Monster Squad to all you Slashaholics. He's the, he has the shirt that says Stephen King Rules. Uh, in the 1987 movie. Uh, I've been talking to him back and forth, and I am literally discussing times that we're going to record with him. Josh and I are going to record with him, and he's kind of kind of ghosted me. So oh. I'm, I'm hoping he's just busy and that he'll get back to us. But, like, I'm telling you, when it was like a 99% done deal. So 
hopefully we can get him for an episode of getting sidetracked because I'm a I'm a big fan of the Monster Squad. I know Josh really likes the movie, so I think that'd be a lot of fun. I think it'll happen, and maybe one day we can do a, a part two with Adam Marcus. I know we got David Bergantino. Yeah, he's going to yeah, do yeah. an episode. Oh wow, uh, he wrote the, uh, Yeah. What did he write, Josh? He wrote the novelization for Wes Craven's New Nightmare, and he also wrote four of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books. Yeah, he's written a lot more. He's done video games, uh, horror games, and stuff and the like. And uh, he was actually helping with Jason X and helped come up with. The tagline, Evil Gets an Upgrade. Yeah, for the movie yeah. poster. Yeah, he's done some uh, Freddy vs. Jason stuff back then, too, I think. He wow. tried getting that Freddy vs. Jason game made um, back on, like, the Super Nintendo era. And uh, it yeah. almost happened. So, What would that game look like? 16-bit? Yeah. That that would be really... What is it? A side-scroller? RPG? <laughs> beat him up? What the hell? What, did, what was it going to be? i got to ask him. Getting sidetracked would be the perfect time to All do right. it. I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, Josh. I, I think Andre. Andre. I think. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. He's I, from what it looks like on his social media accounts. He's busy right now doing uh, Monster Squad stuff, uh, like conventions, and he's doing like showings of the film and like having a meet and greets and stuff. So he's very busy. Uh, so I'm gonna try to touch base with him again, and if we can get him uh, locked in, that would be a really big deal for the channel. So yeah, I'm Josh and I are putting in a lot of work on that, and so we're gonna try to make it happen for you guys. Um, second horror story of the night. Uh, we lost a very important person in the horror, horror community, horror genre. Clue Gallagher, uh, passed away last week. Clue Gallagher was, uh, Bert in Return of the Living Dead. He's the one who owns, you know, the, the medical supply warehouse. He's like the main character in Return of the Living Dead. Uh, he, he's also the father in Freddy's Revenge of, yeah. uh, Mark Patton. It's a goddamn cherry bomb. Uh, what that kid needs is a goddamn good kick in the pants, kick in the butt. Uh, Clue Gallagher. Uh, he was in his 90s, and Clue Gallagher got his start in Hollywood on Westerns and uh, a lot of 1950s and 60s television. He had over 150 credits in film and TV to his name, and he definitely left a huge mark on uh, the horror, horror community. So rest in peace, Clue. It was sad. Uh, it was a sad death. Uh, Clue was killed by Mr. Green in the billiard room with the rope. Uh, <laughs> no, I thought you were about to say, rest in peace, he was great. He's my favorite character uh, from Return from that Return of the Living Dead. Um, loved him in Freddy's. I just couldn't, I couldn't resist because his name is Clue. So uh, I, thought it, I thought it was funny. Maybe it's not. I thought you were going to tell me we lost a great horror icon the other day, Olivia Newton-John. What uh, the hell was she in? <laughs> it was a horror movie. Xanadu? Greece, <laughs> yeah, Greece. When I Greece was the That's first, right. yeah, Gre- Greece was the first horror movie I saw as a child. No, um, <laughs> Olivia Newton John was probably like besides Lucille Ball in uh, Lucy reruns was the first female that I ever registered as a child as like I'm attracted to her. Uh, in Greece, when she like wears all the leather at the end of the movie and sings the one that I want. I remember being six or seven and thinking, like, I don't know what this is, but I definitely think she's very pretty. I, whatever it was, <laughs> whatever it was. And Lucille Ball, believe it or not, was another crush of mine. When in the old fifties episodes of Lucy, I just thought she was really pretty too. Weird. She's funny too. She was funny. Yeah, Lucy that, was that the helps. whole package, baby. Yeah, uh, Oli- <laughs> Olivia Newton John, uh, believe it or not, was. I think she was in her early thirties when Greece was filmed. She was not high school age. She was the they went the Beverly Hills nine hundred two one zero route with that casting. Uh, God needed another angel, and Olivia was the one that he wanted. Ooh hoo hoo! Yeah, um, he, she was seventy three when she passed away this week. Um, young, um, really for nowadays. She so I'm trying to think. I don't now. Don't quote me, Greece aholics out there, but. Olivia Newton-John, uh, it was either The One That I Want or Hopelessly Devoted to You, but one of the songs that she sang in Greece wasn't originally supposed to be in the film. And, like, they had to, like, add it in later on, or they had to, or whatever. But that was the only thing that got nominated for a major award. That was Hopelessly uh, Devoted to You. Yeah, Hopelessly Devoted to You got nominated, I believe, for an Oscar, or and it wasn't even supposed to be in the movie. 
to begin with. That's how talented she was. Not only did she, was she able to get her big song in, but it was also the only song that was nominated. So that's that's kind of amazing. What was her big song in the late seventies, early eighties? Let's get uh, physical. Let's, let's get, get physical. physical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like a Jane Fonda workout tape uh, before Jane Fonda had workout tapes. Hyper color. Uh, you know, wristbands, headbands. She's doing like two and a half pound dumbbell arm curls. <laughs> did she get? Did she try to get physical again in her seventies? Is that what happened? No, I no, I no, but I think, I think I don't, I don't know. I think I don't know. She had been battling cancer on and off for three decades, maybe four decades, and I, I don't think it's confirmed, but I. I kind of am speculating that maybe it had something to do with a reoccurrence of uh, her cancer, but I'm not sure. I don't know. So don't quote me. I have no idea. She's awesome. We loved Olivia Newton-John. She was great. Um, Let's get into the last spooky story of the night. Okay. Josh, this is going to be a big one for you and me too. When I saw it, my eyes kind of lit up. Hocus Pocus 2, which is going to be dropped on September 30th on Disney+. Plus is not the only thing that's going to be Hocus Pocus related that is going to be dropped. Next week, Hocus Pocus 2 is getting a Berry Brew cereal uh, from Disney and Kellogg's. And so they're getting their very own cereal. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be like, it's it looks really good. I hope it's better than the new Ghostbusters cereal because that wasn't very good. Yeah, it wasn't that great. It tasted like too... Berry flavored? It was too good. fruity. It was like crunch berries. Um... The only thing that gives me pause about Ho- this new Hocus Pocus cereal is the fact that there's no marshmallows in it. Oh. There's none. It's kind of straight, like almost. They're going all in on the berry, on the berry flavored, and I'm not sure if I'm sold on it. My daughter used. Uh, she plays Sister Evil on Slash Tracks. My daughter Alexis. Uh, she, she does. Used to, yeah, she used to want uh, Fruit Loops uh, or Fruity Pebbles. I'm sorry, with marshmallows in them. Oh, and now yeah. they make those, like, regularly, even the Malto Mill. We're a Malto Mill family because it's sweeter. The cereal's sweeter than the name brand. And you get a better deal, and you get a yeah. hell of a lot more. So back in the day, before they had the fruity dino bites with marshmallows, what I did for her when she was small is I would buy, like, a bag of marshmallow mateys, and I would go through and pick out every marshmallow in the bag and mix it into the fruity dino bites for her and shake it up. Cereal's just better with I'm, I'm a loving dad, but it's I'm better. smiling because that's the cutest thing I've ever heard, man. That's awesome. It's, it's uh, marshmallows make a great cereal, and especially with like a licensed one like that around Halloween, mm-hmm. I'm honestly surprised that they're not going to have marshmallows in them. That's my yeah, uh, kid, I, it's a good thing. It better listen. I'm a big fan of honeycomb, uh, sugar crisp, kicks. I even like kicks. I like. I like basic cereals, but if this tastes anything like the Ghostbusters cereal and it has no mark, because the old, the one saving grace of the Ghostbusters cereal was that it had ghost marshmallows. Yeah. yeah. So if it didn't, I wasn't eating that shit. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, in your care package, your birthday care package, which you're getting tomorrow, by the way, big guy, awesome. uh, you're getting the Ghostbusters box of cereal. In the, it doesn't I have just a cereal. Got rid of mine. No, no just, it has the box. It has the box. Oh, okay, just the box. Okay. Yeah, collectors, you know, item because those things. By the way, uh, slashaholics, if you guys have like weird limited edition Ghostbusters cereal boxes or Mr. T cereal or whatever, those things can appreciate in value too. Not just VHS tapes. For some reason, I mean, that Ghostbuster cereal, as shitty as it was might the box might be valuable later on because it had a very limited limited run josh couldn't even find it in arkansas for a little while yeah, I, I, yeah i've got some uh stay puff marshmallows i'll send you a bag of each when it when it, the weather cools off a little bit i don't want it to melt coming to you yeah but yeah. i have the big i have a bunch of bags of the big ones and the small ones stay puff marshmallows if y'all oh, want nice those. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah they're they're actually really good too it's just campfire marshmallows but they rebranded the bag um I was going to say about Hocus Pocus, man, I know that we love that movie, but we should, like, think about maybe doing, like, a Slash Tracks episode at some point, just for fun. Uh, Making fun of Hocus Pocus? (laughs) Yeah, especially since part two is coming out, you know? Uh, Maybe not, just having fun with it, you know? But uh, Like we did with Ernest, Scared Stupid? Yeah. I'm all, I'm totally all about doing that for the Halloween special, uh, and I'll even commit to doing it, but... We got to run it by my cat because my cat's name is Binks. 
So, uh, yeah. He gets real emotional and kind of sensitive around this time of year because it's kind of his time. Uh, Hocus Pocus is kind of a big deal to him. So, You know the boy that played Banks in the human form is not the boy that voiced him in the movie, right? No, the boy who um, vo- voiced him in the movie was the Goof Troop kid, right? Yeah, yeah. He was also on Boy Meets World and Step, Step by, by Step. Step by Step, yeah. yeah and he played... Jason Marsden. <laughs> yeah, he played uh, Robin in the made-for-TV, behind-the-scenes 1960s Batman movie. Yeah, uh, and uh, on uh, Boy Meets World, they just let him have his actual name on the show. His name is Jason Marsden. You hear him called Jason, and then Mr. Feeney's like, Mr. Marsden? Uh, so he just he just got to keep his actual name on Boy Meets World. <laughs> that is some. That is the laziest writing I've heard since they named Dan Dan in Nightmare on Elm Street four and five. There are several actors that have that prefer to have character names that are the same name as them because they have a hard time reacting to a different name. Okay. Terry Crews is one of those people. Terry Crews. Yeah, he's, but he's he played Terry multiple times because he has a hard time reacting to the other names. Well, Terry Crews, in his defense, is probably so, like, preoccupied with the fact that he's fucking starving throughout the day because he's an intermittent <laughs> fasting guy. Yeah. He's probably like, I don't have time to do any acting anymore or any, I don't know my lines. I can't think of my lines. I'm fucking hungry right now. <laughs> Stop talking about Hocus Pocus cereal. Um, all right, Josh, time to uh, jump out of that segment and jump right into headlines. I've got a lot more headlines these days because I got the long hair. Headlines or head lies? Oh, headlines. Okay, headlines. Let's do it. Yeah. Headlines. Dude, head lice when we were <laughs> kids in grade school was basically hitting the little kid jackpot. If you had head lice, heaven forbid, it's like, yeah, this sucks. I have head lice, but guess what? I'm going home today, motherfucker. So Mario Brothers 3 and... Uh, Ghostbuster cereal all the way. Yeah, I'm going home. (laughs) Yeah. Um, All right. Pee-wee's Big Adventure was released yesterday. Uh, So on this day yesterday, 36 years ago. Jesus Christ. I was talking about Mr. T cereal about uh, with you like literally two seconds ago. And I remember seeing Mr. T cereal for the first time as a kid in this movie. That's the one Tim Burton did, right? Yeah, it's the masterpiece. It, yeah. Pee-wee's Big Adventure is like almost a perfect film, in my opinion. There's this thing that was called um, <clears throat> the most horrific scene or something. I, I jumped into this trend a couple years ago on the channel. We're like YouTube channels. It was like one horrifying scene. And uh, YouTube creators were supposed to show a scene from a horror movie or something scary, you know, that scared them. And explain why it was horrifying to them. So everybody expected me to do like something from Poltergeist, Poltergeist or something. <clears throat> and I actually picked the Large Marge scene because as a kid, that scared the shit out of me. Yeah, the, the eyes, the yeah. eyes, and the backstory. Yeah. Um, really Beetlejuice esque, like totally pre Beetlejuice vibe. Um, and we're getting one th- Beetlejuice too, man, with Johnny Depp in it. So. Is Michael Keaton going to be back? Oh, yeah. He's coming back. They're okay. all back. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to say about the, when you said terrifying scene from a movie and you picked one from Pee-wee's Big Adventure, I thought the most terrifying scene in that movie for me personally, Josh, would be when he's making his breakfast on his uh, invention, you know, that, that conveyor belt making the eggs, pouring the cereal, feeding his dog. He sets down at his table to eat his breakfast. And the most terrifying part of the whole movie is that he takes one bite of his Mr. T cereal and then just leaves. He doesn't yeah. finish his meal. <laughs> he, like, went through all that for nothing. He just leaves. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, <laughs> did you watch Pee-wee's Big Holiday on Netflix? Yeah, did, yeah it, like in 2014, 2015, yeah. with Joe Man- Manganola or, or whatever his name is. It was, fun. Um, it was fun. It is a fun movie. He's working at the diner, and he's like, what did I tell you about asking me to do things? I don't do things, <laughs> or whatever. I can't remember. I don't like to do things. Like, all he does is work at the diner as a cook. That's his whole life. Um, which is really weird, because the Pee Wee character in the previous movies was, like, all about traveling 
all over the, you know, looking for his bike, and then Big Top Pee Wee, which is a far inferior movie to Pee Wee's Big Adventure, but still pretty good. Um, Did you see the deleted scene? No, what was it? Uh, where his buddy's trying to get him to go uh, go into this movie theater with him, and Pee Wee's oh, like, Shh. "God damn!" <laughs> well, you know what? The Pee Wee masturbating thing—it's like, okay, he's in a porn theater in the early '90s, and it's like, "Oh my god, he's masturbating!" I've what? never judged him. Never what judged him. in the hell is he supposed to be doing in there? <laughs> taking notes? Yeah, <laughs> taking notes good. for his next. You know, TV show or sequel? I mean, come on, dude. It's ridiculous. I've never um, judged him for that, never hated him for it. I was just making a joke. Uh, but yeah, not, I, that's, that, 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 that scene scared me a lot as a kid. So, On a night, just like tonight, it was the scariest thing I ever seen or saw or whatever the hell, Large Marge. And it's like, he goes, didn't he go in that restaurant and said he got a ride from Marge or something? Yeah, yeah, they said that she was the one who died, you know, driving the long haul. I was Um, disappointed, Alex, to find out later. I'm sorry, I keep stopping you from getting to the next headline. I'll I'll shut up. I'm sorry. No, Uh, go ahead. I was disappointed to find out as an adult that there was a song that predated the Pee Wee movie, a country song called Phantom 309, Mm -hmm. which is like exactly what happened in the Pee Wee movie. It's like Tim Burton heard that song, whoever wrote it, and then wrote it around Large Marge. It's about a guy getting a ride from a truck driver, getting dropped off at a cafe, and he tell and he's supposed to tell the people that Phantom 309 sent him, and he finds out that that was a truck that had di- uh, been in a wreck years before, and the driver died. Yeah. It's like down to a T. Uh, I was a little disappointed that uh, the Pee Wee movie ripped off a song for the Large Marge thing, because I thought it was so effective and it comes out of nowhere, you know, uh, great movie. Tim Burton doing the Pee Wee movie was just perfect. Yeah. I think Tim Burton didn't rip it off. I think he found the idea for the Large Marge thing in the basement of the Alamo. Yeah. Okay. That's where he found it, yeah. Because Pee Wee thought his bike was in the basement of the Alamo because of yeah. Psychic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's go into the second headline of the episode. Okay. All right, Josh. It's a, it's another anniversary, and this is a big one, Josh. I don't know if you have any plans for this specific holiday, but this week, uh, as of Monday, so this Monday of this week, this week in 2004, the tour bus for the Dave Matthews Band accidentally dumped roughly 800 pounds of septic waste uh, onto a sightseeing boat on the Chicago River. So They've been Dave- doing it... They- They've been dumping it on the radio stations and, and CD racks for years, so... Don't say that to my girlfriend, Nicole. <laughs> she loves Dave Matthews Band, and they she has a huge poster framed in the hallway with all of her ticket stubs. Boy, you're going to be on the outs with Mother Evil, bud. Oh, no. Ooh, no. <laughs> and we all know, Slashaholics, if you guys watch Slash Tracks, not, not the podcast, but the show... Mother Evil's the one pulling the strings. So Josh just kind of pissed on Superman's cape right there. <laughs> I remember hearing about this story when it happened. Um, Dave Matthews' band had their tour bus, and somebody accidentally unleashed all <laughs> of the septic tank you know, stuff, just let it out on, uh, like when they're going over this bridge, and it dropped onto a sightseeing boat. And it, can you imagine being on this sightseeing boat and you're like, because this is pre-digital camera, really. So they've got their little disposable cameras and their Polaroids and their whatever lunch. They're on the de- they're on the, the deck having a great time on the Chicago River. And out of nowhere, they're just covered with Dave Matthews Band tour bus shit and piss. Luckily, a Charmin uh, semi-truck wrecked nearby. And dropped, <laughs> you know, dropped a ton all of toilet, toilet paper. paper. Wow. <laughs> That, what a coincidence. That was a good thing that that Charmin boat showed up. <laughs> yeah. Um, Josh, did you know? Here's another headline. Drunk woman uh, drives golf cart on Florida Highway. Oh, you said it like that was a superhero. Drunk woman. <laughs> <laughs> she probably thought she was a superhero that day. Um, <laughs> so a woman with an open bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey and a bag was arrested for driving a golf cart on Florida's <laughs> busiest interstate while drunk. So she's driving in the center lane of the Florida's busiest highway, and she was reportedly 
uh, seen passing in and out of consciousness, <laughs> ac- according to a truck driver who was actually a hero in this whole situation. This truck driver actually nudged the golf cart from the middle lane to the side of the freeway to safety, called the police. The police showed up, get, tried to give her a field sobriety test. The woman tried to evade arrest, said she needed to get something out of her bag in the golf cart that she's driving on the freeway of the busiest freeway in Florida. It was low speed chase. Dude. How the hell did she end up on the freeway? Because most, so she's 58. I'm going to guess she lives on a golf course. She's probably day drinking all day long while her husband's out on the golf course. Hops in her golf cart. She's heading back to the house on hole eight. Somehow along the way, she ends up on the fucking freeway. She's blacking (laughs) out. She's passing in and out of consciousness. A semi truck notices it. Pushes her off to the side. I don't even know how he nudged her in a tr- semi truck in a golf cart over to the side of the elbow of the freeway or whatever. But this lady, while she's being arrested, they find a like an open bottle of Jack Daniels in her bag that she was trying to get the bag. By the way, she's like, "Don't arrest me just yet. I have to go to my bag so I can get my Jack Daniels." That's hilarious. That is hilarious. Yeah. So this whole story is just hilarious. I need more information on this. I really would like to know more about this woman. I want to know how she ended up on the freeway. Josh, I worked at a golf course for like six years and it was a private golf course. So it wasn't uh, out of the ordinary for me to like have to make roadies. Like, so if you and Beth lived on the golf course, you could literally be like Alex, Beth and I want four gin and tonics. Um, here's your 30 bucks. Here's a $10 tip. I'm heading back to my house and you just get in your golf cart and drive because it's private, right? It's private property. I don't know how this, I've never once in my mind, uh, ever imagined one of those people just like, well, fuck it. I'm not going home. I'm taking a left. I'm going back out on the city street (laughs) and then I'm going to the, to the freeway. This is in Florida, right? Yeah, this is in Florida. See, you gave me that. You gave me golf course and I did not make a Mar-a-Laga joke one. So we're good. Might have been. Well, I said 58, and we all know that Donald Trump would never uh, be married to someone that's actually re- reasonably close to his own age. So Maybe they were running away from the boredom of his latest golfing tournament or something. Oh, my God. Can you imagine golfing with Donald Trump? Like He'd probably just be lying about his score the entire time. He's uh, upset that, a, that he didn't have more fans show up after the whole raid thing, but I think they were just worried about their warrants and shit. So. They're like, we don't want to be around when this shit goes down if it actually goes if whatever happens goes down we don't want to be in the vicinity of it going down (laughs) so they just take off in a golf cart yeah Um, see you later heading to the freeway i'm drunk as shit i'm going to the freeway in my golf cart uh let's get into the last headline of the show the last story of the show let's do it all right woman intent on revenge sets fire to the wrong house this is some good stories today, man. Uh, so in North Carolina, a woman she tried the to the scene in a golf cart. Sorry, no, dude. <laughs> she tried to fl- she tried to flee though. Uh, North Carolina woman tries to set fire to her ex boyfriend's house, but ended up setting fire to the neighbor's house. Um, she didn't do a very good job either because she was like legitimately trying to stack wood like you'd set like start a campfire. And she had like a can of oil, not gas. Um, and yeah, she was like holding the neighbors, the guy. So she's trying to burn the neighbor's house down, not the boyfriend's house down. And she ended up holding the neighbor's dog. So she's like trying to start a fire like you'd start at a camp with like kindling and stuff with oil, not gas. The na- So she actually started a fire, though. Right. But it's not like burning the house down. It's just enough for the owner to come out and be like, hey, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> also, you're holding my dog. So the lady flees the scene. With the guy's dog, okay, the guy calls the cops, and anyway, this lady ends up getting arrested down the road. She's charged with felony, first-degree arson, multiple other charges. One of the other charges includes uh, kidnapping a dog that's not yours. So this lady <laughs> this lady shows up to burn her ex-boyfriend's house down, so we don't know what the hell the ex-boyfriend did. She goes to the wrong house, ends up kidnapping uh, the neighbor's dog while trying to flee the scene of a house that she didn't set on fire. But she sure as hell tried to. Maybe that was her master plan. You know, ha ha, you'll never cheat on me again. See what I can do. I'll make you the most 
irritating person in the neighborhood. You know, I'm going to mildly inconvenience your neighbors and it's going to be your fault. <laughs> no, she was trying to set, she was trying to set, uh, like an example. She's like, listen, I still want to get back. To, I still want to get back with you. So I'm not going to burn your house down because I like your house. Your I'm going bur- to burn your neighbor's house down and steal his dog just so you can see what I'm capable of. So if you don't take me back, this is what's going to happen to you next. So you're just setting the tone. <laughs> kind of an example uh so josh i gotta get out of here episode's over i gotta head to the freeway i got a golf cart to drive onto the freeway and uh i'm gonna burn my ex-girlfriend's house down hopefully uh but i'm gonna or have half a bottle yeah or her neighbors i'm gonna have a half a bottle of jack before i do it but first and foremost in the show buddy all right be excellent to each other thank you all so much for watching be sure to go to 80stees.com, use slash tracks 30 at checkout. You get 30% off shirts from your favorite TV shows, movies, horror, video games, cartoons, so much more. Check it out. It's a great deal. With that being said, good night. Have a pleasant tomorrow. Say good night, Alex. Good night, Alex. Mahalo, darling.